Hello, and thank you for joining us today as we continue the Living Earth Collaborative and EEPB Spring Seminar Series. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Gideon Erkenswick for his talk entitled Decentralizing and Democratizing Wildlife Biosurveillance. Dr. Erkenswick is a postdoctoral research associate in the labs of Dr. Jen Phillips Phillips and David Wang at the Washington University School of Medicine. His research is centered around the themes of host pathogen interactions, pathogen surveillance, and parasite ecology. Gideon received his bachelor's degree in sociology from Grinnell College in 2006, was an AmeriCorps member from 20, 2007 to 2008, and received his PhD from the University of Missouri in St. Louis in 2017 in the lab of Dr. Patricia Parker. For his PhD, Gideon studied the parasite ecology of associating primate species in the Amazon. In 2009, Gideon co-founded and is president of Field Projects International, which strives to protect and study wildlife using hands-on education and innovations in conservation technology. Since receiving accreditation in 2013, Field Projects International has offered research training programs in field biology, as well as courses in tropical biology and field methods, and has trained over 313 students and offered many scholarships to date. Field Projects International also conducts long-term primate research in the Peruvian Amazon that involves population monitoring, DNA barcoding, and environmental DNA surveillance, as well as the development and deployment of conservation technology tools to more efficiently and economically track individuals. In 2020, Gideon founded the In-Situ Laboratory Initiative to build local capacity to monitor wildlife health and disease emergence in regions with high biodiversity and human-wildlife interaction. The ISL initiative will empower local scientists and community leaders with modern wildlife population monitoring and pathogen surveillance tools. A fun fact about Gideon is that before he became a dad, he was an accomplished woodcarver. I'm sure he's hoping to reconnect with that passion at some point in the future. As a reminder, please post questions that you have for Gideon in the live chat during his talk, and we will read the questions to him at the end. So with that, I wanna thank Gideon for being here today, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to him. Uh, thank you so much, Michelle, for that introduction. Um, you make me sound uh, very impressive, um, and I have to say only that, um, Nothing that I do has been on my own. There are so many brilliant people that have been helping me and it feels wrong to like be acknowledged as the one that is credited for so much of this stuff. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I'm, I will be glad to acknowledge the many people that are involved in the work I do throughout this talk today. And outside of those people you'll, people you'll see, um, there's many, many more. Um, I'll add to your fun fact that I don't have a single of my carvings anymore. I, I never knew that I would have to give it up. Um, and I gave them all away as gifts. So I, now I don't have one carving to show anyone to see, to say like, look, this is how good I was back in the day. Um, okay, so with that, I will begin my talk. Um, so it's an honor to be here today to share my work with you. Um, I wanna thank the Living Earth Collaborative Seminar Series for inviting me. Uh, the goal of this presentation is to tell you of an initiative I am part of that aims to fill gaps in global biosurveillance by establishing decentralized technology hubs and community-led monitoring systems. So I should start by indicating um, what I mean by biosurveillance. So in general, um, I see it as involving uh, a whole bunch of monitoring programs and no single one is going to be always what the academic or scientific communities might consider as sexy science. Uh, it's not always hypothesis driven, but rather it's all about carefully selecting a number of biotic and abiotic variables and monitoring them long term and adding to those variables over time. So these variables will fall under a number of broader categories such as biodiversity, pathogen and parasite research, environmental factors and wildlife health. My colleagues and I believe that technology today uniquely positions us to do very broad biosurveillance work like never before due to the advances in metabarcoding, metagenomics, bioinformatics, and machine learning. And um, 
you know, while designing and creating conservation tools requires really specific expertise, putting them to good use does not. Um, so, um, but I'm going to get back for a moment. I'm going to back up for one second before we talk more about biosurveillance. Um, the, the, the question is, why do anything that's not going to be published in nature or science, at least not in the short term? So this is the Earth. Um, it's a nice figure generated by um, Globia, and they remark, Earth is our common heritage. Uh, it's every child's birthright is a sta uh, every child's birthright is a stable and resilient planet. Um, I would add to that that every species birthright is a stable and resilient habitat. Um, however, the Earth is changing at our expense. Global warming is disrupting ecosystems. It's disrupting human health and livelihoods. It's threatening food, sec food security and water supply. It disrupts economic growth. In short, there are many reasons to care about what happens to this planet of ours, regardless of who you are. Um, now, so now I'm going to share with you some more of their nice images. So this figure indicates wilderness area in red. Um, you can see South America in particular is home to some of the most widespread contiguous wilderness that remains on the planet. In green are our efforts to protect it. Each polygon is, recogn is a recognized protected area. If events unfold here like they have in so many other parts of the world, these green polygons can and will become islands of wilderness. They'll be disconnected and genetically isolated, um, including the populations within, within them. So to quote David Quammen in The Song of the Dodo, which is a book I really enjoy, um, we know that ecological isolation, either by seawater or by other sorts of delimitation, correlates strongly with risk of extin extinction. Islands, he writes, are where species go to die, and islands are what we are making of our wilderness. So a new study has revealed humanity's Goldilocks zone on Earth. As the name implies, the zone is not too hot, it's not too cold, it's just right for us. And our climate niche, um, so where we've thrived for the last 10,000 years, is a temperature between 11 and 15 degrees. And there's uh, still a fair amount of that Goldilocks zone left um, in 2020. But look what happens in 2070. It's harder and harder to find. So by 2070, one third of the global population is projected to experience an average, an, an average annual temperature greater than a scorching 29 degrees Celsius. Uh, that those areas are depicted here in, in white and blue um, raster layers. Sadly, these areas include places like the Amazon, which is also um, which also hosts a disproportionate amount of flora and faunal diversity. So while centering the story around people is important, and that's how Globia um, does it, um, we should be very worried about all other life and how it will cope. The Living Planet Index um, that is maintained by the WWF tracks the abundance of almost 21,000 populations of vertebrates around the world. So we're talking mammals, birds, fish, reptiles, and amphibians. From 1970 to 2016, so 46 years, the average abundance of these populations, representing over 4,000 species monitored across the globe, declined by 68%. And this decline is not evenly distributed. I know probably listening to this, there's people who work in Madagascar and 68% would be like something to celebrate. Like there it's way, way, way worse. And it's worse in South America too. Um, so they have other indices focused on things like habitat and community intactness, but they too show the same sort of downward trends. So, so why do we care about this biodiversity? Um, and there's a lot of reasons, but there is one very direct answer of the many that exist. So on a spectrum from domestic to wild, um, animals and plants, including those that are aquatic and terrestrial, make our existence possible by ensuring we have food. It's as simple as that. Obviously, we don't rely evenly on all species, but it's good to know that if you pluck away one, you have lots of backups. Um, that's something I learned about in, uh, in my PhD at UMSL, about nested communities. They're just more stable. And again, this is just the most direct reason. There are many indirect ways in which biodiversity supports food production and many other reasons beyond food to care about biodiversity. 
So for the rest of this talk, um, I'm actually going to get back to biosurveillance work um, that protects ourselves and the biodiversity that still remains. Um, and I would like to start by describing some of the conservation toolkit and how it is changing, which is at the core of the initiative that I'm a part of. So traditionally, conservation has been very species specific. Ideally, the species is large, it's charismatic because the message is appealing to people. And we hope that by protecting that animal, um, that we protect everything else within that large swath of land that it uses. But today's toolkit has changed so that we are no longer restricted to asking and answering questions about just one species. Now we can simultaneously study a lot more about its world without necessarily changing our sampling effort. So for example, whereas your research question may have been, is this poo from my target species? Does this elephant have herpes virus? Now we could ask, um, what are all the plants in the diet of 96 elephant fecal samples? And that's a really powerful thing that we can, and we, we can do that, people are doing that regularly. Um, so until fairly recent times, we have been limited to one gene, one species uh, population uh, research. But today you can use entire genomes to better describe populations, to discern genetic history and inform conservation efforts such as such as this study did um, on cheetahs, just from a few individuals in Africa. So the sort of data we can generate today from a single sample is truly mind boggling. In fact, um, and I know this well, and I know a lot of other people listening to this talk know this well, that a biologist today really has to also become a computer scientist to make sense of the data. And we don't really talk about like that extra PhD that you have to do. Um, and this can be intimidating, uh, but it doesn't detract at all from the power of these analyses. Um, so here we can take an elephant, for example, from one fecal sample, assuming we have good reference genome data, we can count individuals, we can figure out um, relatedness like paternity between individuals, we can study microbiome and get a sense of gut health, we can look for pathogens, and we can assess their diet. But the source sample doesn't have to be so obviously from a target animal like an elephant. And this is great because many animals you cannot actually get direct samples from. Instead, we can look for trace DNA in footprints, in dens, in water bodies, and in blood feeding, uh, blood feeding arthropods even, if you catch them quick enough. Um, okay, so, uh, so the possibilities right now are really incredible. Um, people are doing this work. Um, I'm sure many of you listening know people doing this work, um, but access to technology is absolutely unequal. These inequalities are everywhere. We see them. Um, we see them in not only who gets to do science, but the kind of science they get to do. And absurdly, habitat countries with the highest biodiversity are often the same countries that cannot afford the luxury of a thirteen thousand dollar thermocycler or the energy or the cash to purchase or support a minus 80 degree freezer for every lab. So science is still generally expensive. Um, and on the right side here are estimates of cost for the modern sequencing platforms used right now to do things like identify coronavirus strains or to, to, to discern subpopulation structure in cheetahs. So these platforms are still pretty much untouchable because of their, uh, the cost of, of just getting them. When they are touchable, um, they remain heavily underutilized in, in the places um, in habitat countries where they generally aren't found. Just because the supplies they need are all coming from places that are far away, the supplies are, are difficult to get and they're expensive to, to use. Um, but slowly things are changing, um, and that's uh, what I'm happy to tell you um, and why I'm excited about giving this talk. Um, so this figure shows the drop in cost in genome sequencing technology over time. Smaller and less expensive options for molecular analyses, such as little mini PCRs or mini centrifuges and gel rigs are being developed. And at the same time, we have miniaturized sequencers. We also have uh, pipetting robots that before would have been extremely expensive and now, although it's still not cheap for maybe $5,000, you can have an automated pipeline carried out in a field laboratory. 
So I assume that most people in the audience here are familiar with the Oxford Nanopore platform, especially the pocket size MinION sequencer. I feel like a lot of the times I book, I'm, I'm doing commercials for, for ONT, uh, it's just because it's the only thing out there like it and it's been opening doors. So it's a neat thing that produces long read outputs. Uh, it has a low initial startup cost of just $1,000 if you're just using their device for research. It's fairly simple and quick library preparation to use it, and it allows for rapid real-time analysis and data transfer via a single USB connection to your run-of-the-mill laptop computer. Um, a single flow cell, so the flow cells technology has been in, improving over time. So now on a single flow cell, flow cell for the Minion, um, you can get upwards of 30 gigabases of data, which is more than enough for highly multiplex amplicon sequencing. So along with portable uh, PCR machines and gel imaging units, which you can see here in the picture, um, it is now completely possible to carry a molecular biosurveillance lab in a backpack. And there are numerous articles in the literature on this topic, um, but the lab in a backpack application is just one end of the spectrum. The point is these instruments offer a variety of options to areas that have some infrastructure or have none at all. So while I, I don't want to ignore the fact that sequencing costs are by no means negligible, um, a single flow cell costs about $900 right now, meaning you have to combine hundreds of samples to make this affordable. Still, the single instrument um, that you see here has pushed the doors open and allows many more scientists to walk into this realm of genetics and genomics. So a typical workflow for a field biologist looks like this. Uh, and I am no exception. This is exactly how my PhD went um, and many before me. So, you know, we often, you know, your university is one location. You go to another location to collect your samples and you bring them back to a distant foreign lab for analysis. Sadly, this leaves out a lot of people that are talented, driven, and very capable. Um, so the question is, what if we could take the lab instead to the samples? What would that look like? And it turns out it looks really good. I've now done it several times. Um, you get diverse scientists participating, stronger collaborations. You get more equitable sharing of research effort and credit. It's, it's a really good thing all around, and it doesn't compromise the research um, in, in many cases. So my colleagues and I recognize the importance of bringing more and more analytical equipment to the field early on for our research projects. Uh, I have some great stories about it if you know I have the chance of talking with anyone outside of this and they want to know about some of those stories. But it's only in the last few years have we really started to achieve this for other groups. And to date, through Field Projects International, um, I've set up three field laboratories. Each group had a different but valuable need for laboratory infrastructure. The first of these was the Green Lab, which is at an ecotourism lodge in Peru and is using the lab for new agroforestry projects. The second was a Lab Biochem. It's a diagnostics lab based in Guadalajara, Mexico, that serves a lot of areas in Jalisco. It wanted to bring molecular diagnostic testing to rural areas. So, you know, we set them up with FTA cards, which can store samples dry, and we had mini PCRs and mini gel rigs. Uh, and it was as simple as that. You could just go and do a test um, in two seconds out in a rural area. Um, Wildlife SOS is a sloth, bear, and elephant rescue organization with multiple sites in India. They are now using a lab to test for pathogens and doing some population genetics work to figure out where all the sloth bears are coming from. If you're not familiar with the issue with sloth bears in India, check it out. It's, it's pretty horrible. They get kind of taken from the wild, uh, separated from their family, and then turned into like little, you know, uh, bears that entertain people and dance. And it's not a good thing at all. So Wildlife SOS does amazing work. And we were so excited that we could outfit them with a lab to facilitate that work. Um, so I want to acknowledge, though, that the, so I use the term field lab, field lab uh, in a broad liberal way. But in some cases, and so some of these labs are not technically in a field. Uh, but sometimes they are. Um, I really do mean field lab. So in this case, this is how you get to the green lab. So 
so that that was a picture of my kids um most people walk you take a boat to the to a to a spot on the river bank then you load up your gear on your backpack and you walk to the green lab but if you're two years old and you smile and giggle and you can break everybody's heart down then they'll bring the motor car over and give you a ride the rest of us walk though um, so in doing this work, it became evident to us that increasing numbers of field stations and research groups are interested in setting up field laboratories for a wide variety of purposes, but there is no larger strategy or vision for how these resources can collectively address today's major gaps in biosurveillance. And this became particularly evident in the wake of COVID-19. And quite frankly, having done this a few times, it's not terribly thrilling to set up single-use laboratories without a larger goal in mind. So my colleagues and I came up with what we believe are the key factors to, across the board, turn these field laboratories into an indispensable system for future biosurveillance and conservation efforts. These include, um, these keys include permanent infrastructure, affordability, local leadership, accessibility, increased sample collection, and standardized data handling systems. All of these things can make these, like together, we believe uh, will result in faster research, scientific independence for country scientists, stronger partnerships, empower local conservation efforts, and contribute to disaster vigilance and preparedness like future pandemics. So with this vision, the NC2 Lab initiative was born recently. Specifically, the initiative aims to make a blueprint for setting up and conducting routine wildlife community assessments and pathogen and parasite monitoring near sites of sample collection. Ultimately, we want to achieve greater funding and adoption of in situ biosurveillance systems worldwide, especially in biodiverse locations where infrastructure is needed and sorely lacking. So to do this, we are presently, we are at the present time going through all the motions of creating the first lab of this initiative in the proven Amazon and not just going through the motions where we're demonstrating its capacity. Um, which is, um, of, so this area is very worthy of attention. Um, uh, and we also have substantial experience working there. Uh, so putting like, you know, giving ourselves good odds that, that this will succeed and show everyone how valuable it can be. So all efforts and systems put to work in Peru will form the blueprint for extending the initiative elsewhere. I also want to mention now that there are six organizations partnering in this initial effort. Um, they include the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, Field Projects International, Washington University in St. Louis, um, the Amazon Conservation Association and its partner um, sister group in Peru, the Asociación para la Conservación de la Cuenca Amazonica, and the Wildlife, uh, sorry, the San Diego Zoo Wildlife Alliance. We are always looking for new partners um, to give this initiative wings. So if if you know of others or you yourself represent an organization that wants to get involved in this effort, we, we hope you will reach out. The more partners, the merrier in this case. Um, so we have lots of issues in that region of Peru. Um, there's extreme amounts of mining for gold. There is continuous logging. There are now, as we, we've all seen in the news that over the past year, lots of wildfires in the past few weeks. Just now there's been uh, immense flooding of certain zones. There is constant agricultural land conversions. And then there's just the general human sprawl because as agriculture expands and, and roads are created, humans just kind of fill in all of the available space. Um, so the Amazon Contra Conservation Association has a project. They, they have the, what they call the MAP project. In 2019, um, they revealed that in that year alone, there was a loss of 1.7 million hectares, um, which is 4.3 million acres of primary Amazon forest across Bolivia, Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, and Peru. That is twice the size of Yellowstone National Park, just for perspective. So the question is, how can the ISL help? Well, the principal way is by rapidly gathering information, which can then be used to locally and, and nationally influence policy and even globally uh, in the case of things like pandemic surveillance and preparedness. The hope is that the more of these types of labs we have, the more um, stakeholders around the world will be listening to what they produce and will be able to react accordingly. And the more of the these kind of labs that there are, the more they will be connected uh, and, and sort of um, 
collaborative in their efforts to monitor or to do biosurveillance. So despite the loss, the, the, the large amounts of habitat loss in the area, the Amazon retains incredible biodiversity. Um, here are some of the amazing fauna that you see when you go there. Um, this is a picture of Alex Weeb. He's a biologist and also the Jonathan Franson Fellow at the Los Amigos Bird Observatory. Recently, he broke the world record for an on-foot big day by recording 347 species. Among those species, he identified one, a new one for the region, the rusty margined flycatcher. So we now have 598 species of birds right where this hub is located, which is an incredible thing. And we want to keep it that way. So, uh, all right, now you have this kind of big picture in mind and why it matters. Um, so how do we translate this into real things on the ground with outcomes and you know, tangible things? So the ISL has three main programs. Um, there is arguably a fourth program called Conservation Technology, but as that program applies to all the others, uh, I don't identify it separately here. And in a moment, I'll give you uh, some examples of what I mean by the Conservation Tech program. But common to all of these things, but sorry, common to all of these programs, there are three things. So one, we need to sample a wide variety of wildlife. For this, we need solid, safe protocols for wildlife capture and handling. Two, we need reliable and standardized ways to collect data across multiple teams. The research is diverse, the kind of data you collect is diverse, so we need a really comprehensive data tracking and organization system. And of course, we need um, the actual in situ lab where we will do local sample analysis. So in terms of wildlife sampling, um, this program will piggyback off of a long term mark recapture effort that has been organized annually by Field Projects International. Uh, it is um, so it's been established since 2009. To date, this project has completed 628 monkey sampling events. So you can see in this right side panel, um, every row re uh, reflects a single individual. So many of the individuals have been sampled across years. And this type of data is key to monitoring population persistence and stability. Also, for several years now, and simultaneously to the primate project, we have been sampling bats, birds, and a range of terrestrial mammals and marsupials. This work is organized and carried out by a number of experienced field biologists and veterinarians. Here, uh, currently, uh, the, the, those that are participating in this are Ana Peralta Aguiar, KC Hill, Leticia Gutierrez Jimenez, Patricia Mendoza, Christian Tirapelle, uh, and Jennifer Stabil. Um, so uh, the bar graph um, over here indicates our expected sample size each year for the various taxonomic groups um, from various sources. Um, what you don't see here is a category for herpetofauna, uh, but I will circle back to that by the end of the talk, and that will be um, led by Jen Stabil. So data systems and integration. Um, so Important to, this is important to all programs. I want to highlight two individuals, uh, Dr. Manalini Watsa and Aaron Erkenswick. We look alike because we're related. We have the same name. We're brothers. Um, but uh, um, that is what field biologists do to get by on a budget. And also, we have some overlapping interests. But um, so let's, uh, so we have been thinking about the best possible way for these labs to organize their data to make them accessible. Um, to not lose track of anything, even though so many different moving parts are happening all the time. So, um, and here are the, the design principles. We want data systems um, that function without the web. Um, they should synchronize with the web for storage and sharing purposes. Um, they need to be customizable to suit a variety of research needs. They need to be compatible with all standard computational platforms like Android and iOS devices. Um, and they have to be low cost and non-proprietary proprietary, if possible, because we really don't want to create cost and access barriers to expanding this initiative. We want people to start using the same standardized systems. So what does this look like? So in this case, um, here's an example. Um, the initiative will have a number of forms for each project, such as a health exam form, a trapping form, a sampling survey. And these are held on an offline data logger, such as a tablet or an iPad. 
These logs will connect and so they, they function without any internet at all, but when they're within a Wi-Fi zone, they connect and they transfer all of their data to a central cloud server. From that server, the data is sent to a backup location. So we have versions of the database constantly being created. And it also can be queried in real time to show progress. So I'll show you some of the conservation technology we, we, we're using is, is constantly sending data to this cloud system. Um, and you can actually visualize the progress of the research you know, in, you know, programs in, in real time with just simple things like our Shiny apps, uh, which are fairly easy to create. Um, so uh, metadata uh, relevant to samples will be accessed by the lab and then analysis logs and results will go back to the cloud server um, and then all of that all those results um, and sampling efforts can be automated to generate PDF reports you know if you have to provide them to permitting agencies or CSVs for further analysis um, and things like sequence data will be regularly piped to larger public repositories like BOLD or GSAID or NCBI. So here's an example of what the data logger looks like. It's a simple survey form, but also has functionality to take images, GPS points. Soon it will be able to um, record sound and video as well. Um, in addition to obviously, um, you know, having standard text entry, Benjamin Lieberger has been crucial to getting this ready for us. Um, then, of course, is the infrastructure to do on-site analysis. Um, here are some individuals that have been crucial to getting it ready in time. The lab that, uh, well, I'll show you a picture of it in a second, will be ready to be used for the first time, um, we think, by mid-June this year. So Judith Westphere, Carlos Castaneda, Juan Loja, and um, Rinalini Watsa are all involved in the design and implementation of it. Um, this involves, so, uh, so what we decided to do was to renovate an existing building. Um, and so that building will have a training area. It'll have a maker space for the conservation tech developments. It'll have a general purpose area, an animal preparation space where you really go in there with only you know, PPE on to make sure that whatever bait or traps you're using don't come in contact with humans, especially now while we have SARS-CoV-2. Um, there's uh, also the equivalent of a BSL-2 laboratory with separate locations for extractions, a PCR prep area, a sample storage area, and then a general purpose place. Um, so then of course, um, oh sorry, I, and just to back up real quick, we don't expect that every hub of this initiative will have this kind of infrastructure. Um, the point is that the blueprint we produce ultimately will be very modularized so that the best options can be easily identified depending on the funding, the space available, and what the monitoring goals would be. So then, of course, is the equipment. Um, I don't want to go into details about it, um, but I do want to highlight that the goal is for the lab to function independently. So the guiding principles for getting equipment include renewable energy sources, so direct solar and solar powered battery systems, the production of laboratory grade water so we're not dependent on like external you know inputs as much uh, waste disposal but also so appropriate waste disposal because sometimes these labs will be in habitat areas um, but also a recycling system to try to minimize single-use plastics and there are things out there that do this like you can you can wash filter tips believe it or not they're they're the the automated systems that are out there are fairly expensive right now but this is the kind of place that we should be striving to get where we can actually reuse tips and filter tips and PCR plates and PCR tubes. Um, and of course, we want to source equipment from, um, from industry research labs, from academic research labs, um, through donations or just purchase used items because we get much of the equipment that's out there. I mean, there's a huge technology graveyard, especially for laboratory equipment. You can get a lot of things very cheap that work perfectly well, um, but are not suitable for like the industry labs that are on the cutting edge and always have the newest and only use things for a certain period of time. Um, and then finally, we want to hack as many protocols as possible to limit dependency on kits. I think some of you may be in labs that have struggled to get common reagents and kits because of the demand for testing for coronavirus or 
vaccine production. So we want the lab to be able to create its own in-house extraction buffers and nucleic acid storage buffers, and that is very achievable. So back to our three main programs, each has a series of projects that will produce tangible outputs, and I prepared a single slide for each. Um, so starting with biodiversity, you know, our, our foci are long-term monitoring, barcoding the Amazon, um, trace DNA in field laboratories. Um, so basically looking for target species that are otherwise hard to document through trace DNA samples, and then the use of conservation technology. Um, so for the first of these, the long-term wildlife monitoring, We'll focus on population, populations that we have been working with for several years now, including the primates I mentioned earlier, but also birds that have been banded there for a while, um, and small mammals that are you know, currently existing with tags. So we'll continue to add to these populations, um, known individuals, and then we'll track them over time through various ways. Um, for barcoding effort, um, we're going to be relying on portable sequencing technology complemented with large multiplexing strategies. We tested this out in 2018. This paper is in review right now. We basically collected 400 samples across many research projects and sequenced them all in a single run. Um, it included uh, plants, uh, mammals, um, such as bats, marsupials, rodents, primates, legomorphs, birds. Um, I've I've, we've excluded plants from this phylogeny, but you can see all the unique species that have been identified from consensus sequence from that single run. We managed to get all the sample cost, the per sample cost down to about three to four dollars for this. Um, so it's equivalent to if you were just using overnight sequencing here, you know, in the US. And then finally, for the trace DNA work, we're developing lamp or isothermal amplification kits because they're very cheap. They have a high detection threshold or low detection threshold, um, and they require minimal resources. You just need a heating element. I don't have any image for that, but just wanted to mention it. Um, and so for conservation tech, how does that fit into the project? So I've pictured here a few examples for you. To start, um, we've designed a LoRa uh, mesh network. LoRa stands for Low Power Wide Area Networking System. It's ideal for long range communications of small packets of information. So we basically put up these, uh, we, we, they're kind of like ears in the sky and towers and tall trees in the area that listen for information from all the devices the LoRa enabled devices that we have throughout the forest doing different things. And here's an example of some of those things. We have made our own GPS collars. Uh, we developed our own after many years of being frustrated that no affordable options existed for tamarind monkeys. Now that we've developed this, we can easily scale it up for uh, to use for larger animals with longer battery life. Um, we call these the biscuit that you see here. Um, we have this, uh, what we call here, the nature chip. Um, it is a, a basically this multifunctional system where it'll read an RFID tag, it'll weigh an animal, it'll snap a picture, and it also has an attachment for calling animals to the site. So if you have a population that's habituated to a baiting regime, then you can sort of call them to the areas, you could bait this, and as animals uh, go on to it, you'll record all sorts of information about them without ever having to recapture. And that, so that's the beauty of it. We want like more year round monitoring without having to have personnel constantly on the ground doing it. Not pictured here, we're, we're creating smart traps, which are like live Tomahawk and Sherman traps that have a sensor that now notify you when they've been triggered. And there's also, for some of them, there'll be a, a, a control such that they can be opened and, really, and an animal can be released after being held for a period of time. And the goal there is to collect non-invasive samples um, you know, reliably. So you can have a trap set, an animal goes in, it's held for a certain period of time, hopefully makes a, hair, like, makes a poop sample or leaves a hair sample, and then it leaves and nobody has to interact um, too much. All devices are low power, consumption and constantly talk with this LoRa mesh network um, so we can become lazy but still very effective um, researchers. Uh, two people uh, heavily involved in this process are Ishan Raghunanda and he's the engineer behind most of this. He's based in India and Murnalini Watsa. Projects for disease biosurveillance involve collecting wildlife health metrics, documenting parasite richness and diversity across a range of species, and likewise bacterial and viral pathogens across a range of species. 
Um, parasite surveillance at, at this site started in 2012 as part of my dissertation, um, for which I was limited to analyzing about four years of data on blood and intestinal parasites. So now with this on-site lab, we'll be able to regularly assess the parasite community across all the species we interact with, um, and we'll, we'll create even better baselines of prevalence, richness, and host specificity, and then we'll monitor for deviations as sort of ecological indicators. Um, in addition to building on that, we will now make a concerted effort to look for bacterial and viral pathogens of regional and global concern. Uh, on, the, on the agenda are mycobacteria, leptospira, coronavirus, picornavirus, herpes virus. Um, we have a phased approach to this work. In our first year, we are concentrating on sample collection and the application of consensus PCR detection followed by amplicon sequencing on the minion. In year two, we're going to shift our focus towards the use of LAMP technology since it requires minimal equipment. It's highly specific, can, you know, detects things with a low threshold, um, and results can be interpreted by a naked eye. Um, and beyond that, we want to push the boundary of viral metagenomics on the minion. Um, so alongside the disease screening, we collect a range of animal health metrics and are exploring potential biomarkers of immune activation or infection, such as urinary neopterin, which we, we explored here in 2018. Um, standardizing the use of these biomarkers is still very much in the planning phase. So if this is something that you are interested in, please feel, feel, feel free to contact us for further discussion. We are, we are always open to good ideas and love collaborating. So as part of our first year effort to establish a well-rounded panel of consensus PCR tests, we've created a tool to assess candidate consensus primers from the literature against all present reference sequences on NCBI or any other DNA data database of choice. Um, Jenny Chen, who's currently at Harvard University, did the coding for this program. Um, the tool can help you tweak primer degeneracies or develop entirely new ones as greater pathogen diversity is recorded. Um, the tool is right now on GitHub. It's lacking documentation. I was supposed to put that up recently, but I decided to plan for this talk today. But it will be up soon. Um, you can go ahead and use it if it would be relevant to you. And if you hit any, any, any bumps, um, feel free to email. So um, lastly, it would be remiss to do biosurveillance without um, also understanding what toxicants are in the environment, and if present, including them in the surveillance effort. Otherwise, um, they might constitute a really obvious confounding variable. You would notice a pathology or some kind of odd pattern in animal behavior, and you attribute it to, say, parasites. But what's really going on is there's some kind of toxicant in the environment that is causing some erratic behavior or interfering with reproduction. So deciding what to look for and monitor will necessarily be specific to each location, depending on surrounding human activities and local industries. In southeastern Peru, around this first ISL hub, mercury is an enormous environmental challenge, as I mentioned earlier. So with the help of veterinary toxicologists at the San Diego Zoo, um, specifically Carolyn Moore, and the purchase of a total mercury analyzer for the field laboratory, which has, which aside from the initial upfront cost to purchase it, has no consumables, um, will be monitoring mercury bioaccumulation across the faunal community. We conducted a broad survey for mercury among birds, bats, terrestrial mammals, and primates in 2018, and we found significant bioaccumulation relative to other sites in the area um, that are more distant from artisanal mining operations. Um, and we found in significantly higher levels, for example, in breeding females among the primates that we capture, uh, capture annually. And since we know, you know, elevated mercury levels contributes to neurological dysfunction and interferes with reproductive output, like this should be alarming. So these data are unpublished and that's why you don't see any uh, taxa associated with any of these measurements. I apologize for that, but they will be available soon. All right, so now to quickly wrap up, everything we do, we're trying to make sure that there's data reproducibility and they're sharing. All tools are gonna be open access and available. So papers will be put on bioarchive as soon as they're available. Sequences will be deposited to bold systems for anyone to, to see. Um, all, like I said, we'll use GitHub and protocols.io for everything so that if you want to replicate this, it's going to be right there, easy to do. Um, and we're very committed to affordability and frugal science. Um, and I think, you know, it's ironic. People will say, well, you, you got a grant to do this work. So, you know, how do you expect someone without any, like, you know, any grant support to do this? So to that, we are going to say that if you throw thousands of dollars at something, 
like we are at this moment in time, let it be because in the end you can make something that will only cost a little to reproduce. So that is our guiding principle there. Um, and finally, we, we are committed to community-led uh, biosurveillance. So um, we have teaching, uh, we have programs to teach the techniques that we're using. Uh, we, we hope to have at least two a year and I expect that within one year, these will be taught by the local leadership that we have. Um, just in case anyone would like to participate in this initiative, there are a couple of ways. We are still looking for donated laboratory equipment. Um, we have research training programs for anyone that wants to experience this, this effort firsthand. It, they're available. Um, you can see details about them on fieldprojects.org. Um, and like I said, I would circle back to the herpetofauna that we haven't sampled, we haven't included in our collections previously. We are kicking that off with a herp bio blitz in August for two weeks, which is um, organized around a, a, a molecule, like a genomics in the jungle field course. So we'll have expert herpetologists in the region and several really experienced molecular biologists all working together to survey, collect samples of herps, including so amphibians and reptiles. And then those samples will be analyzed in real time in the lab. And from that point onwards, we'll be ha we will have a fixed regular monitoring program for, um, for herps as well. Uh, I really quickly just need to acknowledge um, two people who are who I, I use as um, sounding boards constantly. Um, so the labs that I'm involved with at WashU um, are uh, Jennifer Phillips and Dave Wayne. Um, and with that, thank you. Um, that's my talk. I hope I didn't take up too much time. And we, if you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. Thank you so much for that fascinating talk, Gideon. Um, I just wanna remind everyone to please post questions in the chat so that Jess and I can relay those questions to Gideon. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes for questions. And the first question comes from John Birmingham who says, I heard that minion reliability was suspect. Have you encountered this as a problem? And if so, has it improved recently? Um, it would be, it'd be better to know what you mean by suspect. Um, do you mean error rates? They do have higher error rates than Illumina sequencing platforms, but it all comes down to read depth. So you can create highly confident consensus sequence from it. Yeah, one read will have higher error. So if you're trying to multiplex thousands of samples and you get really low coverage, um, then you'll have trouble being very certain about your sequences. But if you, know, you get 100 reads for each consensus sequence, um, then you can, you're getting like 99.9% .9 accuracy. All right. Thanks so much, Gideon, for the fascinating talk. Um, while we wait for more questions to come up in the chat, I was wondering, I think the work you're doing is, is incredible. And I was, I was actually just wondering how you personally became interested in this this idea of, of decentralizing and, and initiating community-led wildlife biosurveillance and like the work you do with Field Projects International? Um, it's a good question. Well, I never had a master plan. It just kind of happened through a lot of frustrating research experiences. You know, getting samples out of Peru has its complications. Um, yeah, there's a lot of bureaucracy there's also a lot of concerns like, are my samples going to be okay? Are they going to thaw? Like what's happening? Who's going to deal with this? It's my life is on the line. So there's a lot of personal stress involved that like motivated us to try to do more and more in the field. And then, you know, when, since we've been working in this area for so long and meeting so many brilliant people who are capable, but just don't have the funding to actually get the experience um, that, that we have, um, you know, we just decided like, enough's enough like we should start bringing the lab there and there, these things can be done in the field um, and then when the pandemic hit um, you know we thought to ourselves like there are there's so much more surveillance that could be going you know on around the world if if we didn't depend on like a few major programs like there are some pretty big awesome programs out there the eco health alliance 
the predict program, USAID funded things. Um, you know, Guelph is barcoding things all over the world with, with bold. Um, but like, these are all highly centralized and there's a, there's, there's problems with that. Like you have, I mean, you can have administrations change funding and just kind of cut programs like rapidly, you know, um, and the people involved in it are tend to be all in one location. Um, and you know, there's people who are permanently in places that need monitoring and aren't doing it, not because they don't want to or have an interest to just because we've always been exporting, extracting to other places. Yeah. It's really interesting. I guess, so one question that I have um, is where you see or how you see um, the Institute initiative expanding to other areas? Do you think it'll be um, people reaching out to you or an application process or how do you envision it kind of going beyond um, the current location in Peru? Well, I expect it would be kind of grassroots, right? Which I think by nature has a lot of different ways that, it, you know, it'll take place. But, you know, we're going to be promoting it from our end. Um, and then we hope that the work will be heard of um, and and people will contact us and say, hey, like, I see this system, this comprehensive program you have. I'd like to do it, but this is my funding constraint. These are my these are my infrastructure constraints. What how much of it can I achieve? And like, if this is the budget, what should we start with? So that's what this blueprint is supposed to be about. And um, yeah, in terms of expanding, um, yeah, it's it's. I, I hope I hope that people will reach out to us, but we have every intention of getting expansion funding for it. You know, once we've demonstrated it, I hope there will be more funding agencies that recognize that this is worthwhile. And then, and then once we have a mandate to do this elsewhere, opportunity of saying like, hey. You work in Madagascar, like, do you have a lab already? What does it do? How can we make it more, you know, you know, similar to what or comprehensive is what we're doing here in Peru? And yeah, we'll see what happens. But the, the point is that we, we really do want a organized way of growing. So we want people to, to, to uh, see the, 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 logic behind using similar data tracking systems and similar wildlife sampling systems because that will standardize stuff and give the scientific academic you know uh, communities a lot more confidence in in what's coming out of, of these laboratories excellent um, so I was, I was wondering, I'm just curious what your thoughts on this are. So you talk a lot about bringing field labs um, to these areas. What else would you suggest that like we as scientists or, or professionals, conservation or biodiversity professionals who, who kind of benefit from the, the privileges of working in a place like the United States, um, like what can we do to help like build sustainable capacity for researchers in these countries? Um, with less equitable access to these benefits and to help them gain more scientific independence beyond just, just field laboratories. Well, I think, I think training, right? So one thing that that's what Field Projects International has been all about since we started is that, um, you know, there's, there's a group of researchers that, you know, the more, the more privileged type that have access to institutions with resources, grant funding, everyone that comes has to provide local trainings. It's just part of the it's just part of how we operate. Um, and so you um, yeah, you, you 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 welcome people onto your team to participate in the work and you try to make sure that the cost of doing that is low. Um, so it's it's helpful when you have like an organized. So that's why Field Projects International was created to kind of um, consolidate that effort to make it more feasible um, as like a single person. I mean, the best thing you can do is teach where you can teach, <laughs> um, show the process, and then it, it'll probably become pretty evident that it can be done by, by others there uh, if you just give them the tool. So, um, you know, that's, that's what I would say. I, you, like, you know, don't try to just get in and get out, but like you actually wanna leave uh, your, 
your knowledge with people there. So um, there's education is an amazing thing. Like you, you open somebody's world. Um, and uh, like, that's how my world was opened. And um, I think it, it should not be underestimated as a conservation tool. Definitely. Um, so they have another question that's just come in from Anna. It says, do you believe that ISL and FPI programs could contribute to monitor and predict future zoonotic diseases or pandemics? Yes. Um, I mean, w w here's what I think. Um, so we don't want to, we tried to change the, the conversation away from, you know, the risk is coming from these wild communities, these wildlife with things that we don't know about. So we want to change the rhetoric from we have to go there, collect samples and find things that are infectious or dangerous to humans. In fact, animal populations are like sentinels. They also are going through these pandemics and outbreaks. So what you want to do is sample regularly over time so that you can see when things are changing. So if you're only like looking at blood parasites, for example, maybe there's less likelihood that that becomes like a giant outbreak. and you know, affects a ton of people, but you'll be able to detect that something's going wrong in the local animal population, you know, if the diversity of blood parasites changes dramatically, or because you're, you're regularly sampling from them, all of a sudden you realize we only captured 30% of the animals we normally do. So it's basically using these wild systems as indicators of when something goes awry. And like, if there are viruses, like coronaviruses, you know, that is that evolve and kind of do some sort of species jump within a wildlife community like that is one big unknown like we know now that SARS-CoV-2 came from had a zoonotic origin came to humans and then now is just running through human populations out of control how often does that happen in the wild we don't know how much interspecific transmission is taking place in wildlife communities between things like bats and rodents and monkeys and bats because there aren't many programs that sample across diverse taxa like this. Very interesting. Um, we have, I think we have time for one more question. So this is from Sasha Heath. Um, what do you see as the long-term economic viability of the program? Do you see this as eventually self-sustaining or do you think it will rely on external fundraising? Yeah, great question. Um, so we, we want it to be self-sustaining. Um, and how do we achieve that um, is, yeah, what, what, what can these labs offer to local communities that will regularly be valuable that could provide, provide some kind of a, economy? So um, that's, that's an ongoing um, uh, sort of area. <laughs> of exploration um, and it may vary depending on the community but like we know for example that in peru um, there are animals that are being um, extracted from the wild they wind up in rescue centers they're being used for reintroductions um, you know because there's only limited ability to keep them in captivity for very long so like there is a there's a potential niche like you could have a laboratory that's dedicated to doing sort of health screening diet like pathogen screening prior to animals being reintroduced um you could um liaise with local universities to basically say well, you don't have a laboratory like this you can't offer this kind of training is there kind is there government funding or are there private school is there a little bit of funding for students to come every two weeks to do a to do a module on you know, genetic, you know, like some kind of molecular lab, you know, exercise. Um, I, 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 there are creative solutions to this. Um, and then like the labs we've set up before, they have like an agroforestry, the green lab has all these agroforestry interests and they're trying to cultivate fungi for consumption. And they want to know like all the various species that they're collecting from. So, so they have a need for, you know, quickly identifying things using molecular markers that are better than sort of morphological characters. So um, it may vary a bit by place, 
but I think there are some standard options that should be pursued in every location. Great. Well, we are right at five o'clock, so I think we're going to have to wrap up now, but I want to thank you again, Gideon, for a wonderful talk and to everyone for tuning in. Uh, and I hope you'll join us again as our seminar series continues next week. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>